we hear and feel in these words and in this place. Amen. We are entering into a season of Advent, and we have these little guides in the back outside the Fellowship Hall, these little Advent books. These are wonderful. Um, Linda mentioned that there is one available for each family to share and to go through, and you are challenged this season to attend church each Sunday in Advent as we journey through this book together. Next week is the first Sunday of Advent. This is an amazing season as we journey together towards Christmas. The word Advent, when broken apart, means to come, or it's a Latin term that means coming. So we use these weeks leading up to Christmas as a chance to look forward to our celebration of the arrival of Christmas, of Jesus, the Messiah, the light of the world, of our Savior. Advent is a season of great expectation, and we are thrilled to be here today as we embark on a journey. And actually, we join in an epic journey that began over 2,000 years ago. And we follow the star and discover the light of the world. It's a journey of the heart and of the soul, but it's also a journey that's going to realign our expectations and experience of the Christmas season. And in its and it's also a journey where we will explore all of the gifts of Christmas delivered by and through Christ. And those gifts are hope, love, joy, and peace. We all need hope in the storms of this life and love that never gives up. We need fresh joy on our journey and peace no matter what we're facing or dealing with in our life. Our journey and series will center on the star as our guiding light. Now, this star of Bethlehem has taken on a central place in the Christmas story, but its mention in the Bible is really very brief. The record of wise men from the East who followed a star is only mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 2, um, which accounts uh, Christ's coming. And there's much discussion by scholars and scientists about what the star actually was, who the wise men were, and when this cosmic event took place. But apart from the deba these debates, there remains the truth that the light of a star led people to Jesus, even if they were still on their journey the night Jesus was born. And I say that because most scholars place the wise men showing up actually a few months to maybe even a year after Jesus was born. So it's not like today where if we saw a bright cosmic experience in the sky, we could hop in our car or take a plane and just zoom over to that place. They had to journey there by foot, which took some time. So it wasn't like they could just get there in 24 hours or a couple hours. You see the star is a guide then and is a guide now that ultimately leads to Jesus, who is the light of the world. As we embark on this journey, this Advent season, we will start our readings this week and we will build up to hope. We all should be encouraged to look for the light in the world and the light in our lives. The Advent season is about journeying as much as it is about the destination. As we explore, it's a time to prepare and maybe pause and think about, and ponder, breathe deeply and turn our eyes to the true meaning of this time of the year, a season that can seem so hectic and stressful in our culture. No matter where you find yourself today, you're invited to join us on this journey. Think about the people who were part of this journey originally toward the first Christmas. Well, let's see, there was Mary, Joseph, an innkeeper, a jealous king, some wise men, common shepherds, angels, and so many more. While the pace of our lives would probably make their heads spin, each of these people were facing daily difficulties that we, in this culture and time, would want no part of. They didn't have all the answers. They hadn't spent hours getting ready and making sure they were prepared for these supernatural events that they were about to witness. They didn't even understand what was happening all the time even when angels appeared or a star guided their path. 
But all the Christmas story cast answered God's invitation to come and see the arrival, arrival of his son, the light of the world, and the savior of all. Will you say yes to this journey? Will you peer through the darkness of your life, no matter what that may be, and look for a glimmer of hope, love, joy, and peace? Will you step toward the light of the star, even if your vision seems cloudy or muddled? Will you journey toward Bethlehem, drawn by the hope, love, joy, and peace that awaits there? Is that a difficult vision for you? Does your starry night seem a little cloudy? Is your Christmas season over overwhelmed already by a number of struggles? Maybe these struggles are financial stresses or dysfunctional relationships or loss or memories of loss or commercialized expectations rushing around, trying to please everybody with everything that this world has to offer. We've all been there at some time or another. We might be there now in some form or another. But be encouraged. That's exactly where Jesus' hope, love, joy, and peace shines the brightest, in the darkness. How do we follow the star on this journey? How can we purposefully live this season of anticipation in Christ's light? I'd like to suggest that it starts with acknowledging the darkness that is around us. Embrace the weight and commit to this journey. I have with me a handy dandy little flashlight. Right now I can turn on the light, doesn't seem too exciting, can't really see very much. But if we found ourselves in complete darkness, we might feel very, very differently about this little handy dandy gadget. Imagine you are home at night and the power goes out. We might say, wow, it's dark in here. If we had a way to find ourselves to the front of the house, if we needed to leave it, or to find candles, that would be tough. Or if we are in the dark forest at night, if we've been camping, and we might be in the forest at night, we might have wandered away and can't find our way home, we'd say, wow. It's dark in here, and this handy-dandy little flashlight might be just what we need to find our way out. It looks much brighter when it shines in the darkness. Can you see it a little better now? I can see things a little better now. Okay, ooh, ooh, it's kind of scary sometimes. All right. It's kind of amazing that God chose a star to guide the Magi to Bethlehem. Throughout the Bible, we see how God used creation to reveal things to us. The psalmist put it beautifully in Psalm 19, one to four, which says, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech, they use no words. No sound is heard from them, yet their voice goes out through all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. And Psalm 8 says, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? God's glory is seen in the stars, but the thing about stars is that they can't be seen in the light. It's the same as the flashlight, only on a more celestial scale. They are there, but we can't see them. My boys have been talking about how it's getting harder and harder at night to see the stars because of all the lights of the city. We can best see stars on the darkest of nights when there's no moonlight away from the lights of the city. The darker the setting, 
the brighter the starlight. The darker the setting, the brighter the starlight. This time of year, holiday glitz can artificially light our lives. You know, like the star showers or the holiday lights that we go see, all those beautiful displays. Or we may seek out our own flashing distractions to try to distract us from the gnawing darkness within ourselves. But facing the darkness and calling it what it is allows us to see the true light. It's when we acknowledge the darkness that we can see the star that leads us on through our journey. As we journey together toward Christmas this Advent season, let's be honest about the darkness we find ourselves in, both darkness in the world around us and darkness that sometimes comes in our own hearts. We live in a world full of darkness and fear, but it is into that great darkness that even greater star appears to light the way. The Bible shows that us it was a pretty dark time for the people of Israel when Jesus showed up. The Old Testament prophets had prophesied a Messiah, but it had been a long wait, hundreds of years of waiting. Isaiah talked of the coming light in the present darkness, and that darkness continued to grow through the centuries. People walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the deep darkness, a light has dawned. That is from Isaiah 9, 2. This verse was spoken long before Jesus was born. The people of Israel lived in that space between promise and fulfillment. Looking back, it's easy for us to see how the first Passover, when God spared the firstborn of the Israelites in Egypt and set them free from slavery, foreshadowed the coming of Jesus, the Passover lamb. But the people of Israel didn't have the benefit of hindsight. They were desperate for a deliverer. Honestly, many of them thought God had forgotten them, especially as they lived under the Roman oppression in the time of Herod. At times we share that common experience of darkness and desperation. Nothing can rescue us except God. And the beauty of this journey to Christmas is what we see. In what seems like the darkest hour, God shows up. We can find and continue to draw hope, love, joy, and peace, knowing that Jesus entered our darkness that first Christmas. His Spirit will fan even the smallest spark within us and draw us onward toward vibrant faith rooted in the work of Christ. It is not an instant process, but it is a real process that gives us what we need throughout this journey. Who likes waiting? No one? Does, does anyone like waiting? One hand. Uh, I know my children did not enjoy waiting. The countdown for Christmas began the night of Halloween. Um, nor do many Browns fans enjoy waiting for the first win of the season. So that might be a while. Um, we live in a culture that does everything possible to reduce the amount of time that we spend waiting. If you just see how many fast food restaurants drive up ATMs and how I act when my internet doesn't go as fast as I want it to go. Um, I don't think most of us would do very well living in the days of the Israelites. The people of Israel in the Bible knew all about the long wait. Since Genesis, in the very first book of the Bible, when sin entered the world, we see that God offered the promise of a life fulfilled. In Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 through 15, God cursed the serpent that tempted Eve and said that through her offspring will come one who will crush the serpent, the fear we all live with daily. This was Jesus, the source of a whole life from the very beginning. God had a plan from the start, but constrained by the time of our world, the waiting seemed like forever. Imagine a farmer standing on the dry dust of a parched field and looking up at the sky. Years of drought have taken everything from him, and he has lost hope. But then, in the distance, he hears the rumble of thunder, the promise of rain. That is the image John the Baptist gave of himself when people asked if he was the Messiah. No, he was not, but he was announcing the arrival of the long-awaited one. He was the herald of Christ. I'm thunder in the desert. Make the road straight for God, he cried. Advent is a time of waiting. While it feels unnatural, 
there is a great benefit in embracing this season as we anticipate the coming of Christ. The waiting reminds us where our faith is set. It allows us the time and focus to hear the distant rumble of thunder, the promise that our lives will be fulfilled beyond our imagining, if we are open to this. And while we wait to celebrate Jesus' birth, we also wait for when Jesus comes again. This will be the ultimate fulfillment of our deepest desires. The Apostle John described it this way, After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. We still live in the space between the already and the not yet, and so our challenge is to embrace the waiting. You could say that the waiting shapes our very faith. It draws us onward, giving us expectations that our belief and longing will be fulfilled as God has promised. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 says, Now faith is confidence in what we hope and for an assurance about what we do not see. Will you allow this Advent season to serve as a reminder of the confidence we have as we wait in hope, love, joy, and peace for what we do not yet see? Will you seek the light of the star, no matter how faintly it might first appear to you, and draw faith from its glowing light? Are we all ready to commit to this journey? To some commitments a little hard. Sometimes we need pushed a little bit, but usually once we commit, we're glad we did. I don't know about you, but my natural image of waiting and the image of a journey are really two different kinds of things. Um, one involves just sitting and waiting, and the other involves moving. But the concept of waiting throughout the Bible is one of active waiting. We wait with expectant hearts, but we constantly are moving forward in our journey, in our journey in our lives, in our journey of faith, and now in the journey in the Bible towards the birth of Christ. Our scripture today in Matthew 25 is a perfect example. As Christians, we can't just sit still. We need to prepare our hearts and acti actively care for those around us. A priest, professor, writer, and theologian, Henry J. M. Newen, describes the waiting we see in the scripture as very active. He wrote in, um, in Waiting for God, active waiting means to be present fully in the moment, in the conviction that something is happening where you are and that you want to be present in it. What an excellent description of Advent. Waiting means being active, present in the moment, while still anticipating where we are going. That's not easy. Waiting involves a commitment to being present in our journey of expectation and our active anticipation. The good news is all in, I'm sorry, the good news in all this is that whatever you are, wherever you are on our journey, it's okay. We can keep moving, keep following God's light. Surely we have, sure we have four weeks um, to prepare for Advent that leads to Christmas. But that is a human created calendar a timing not set by God. Advent is about the deadline 
to have to be, to have to get prepared by. It's not about finding all the answers or checking out all the boxes or getting everything on the list. It's about preparing, preparing our hearts, preparing our minds. You just must show up and be willing to follow God's lead. Wherever you are, you are not too late. God wants to fill our hearts with hope, love, joy, and peace for the ultimate healing of life found in the light of the world, Jesus Christ. Please join us in devotion this week and gather together in worship on Sundays as we actively anticipate the arrival of Jesus in our journey to Christmas.